Alex, we good to go? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, my name is Chip Lyons. I'm the president and CEO of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. I'm just going to provide a little bit of context for what I think is a fabulous uh, webinar um, because of uh, what there is to report and those on the panel that are uh, reporting it and explaining it and having the opportunity um, for some questions and uh, discussion. Um, I just want to, I suspect for the number of people um, on the webinar, you're familiar with the latest UN AIDS data, um, along with the Start Free, Stay Free, AIDS Free report um, that was just released, which combined paint um, a really troubling picture. Only 54% of the 1.7 million children in the world living with HIV are accessing treatment. Only 40% of children living with HIV globally were virally suppressed in 2020. This treatment uh, gap um, has a number of causes, um, but it is partially due uh, at least and maybe materially due to suboptimal, previous suboptimal treatment. Um, Lynn Moffinson, Dr. Moffinson is going to speak next um, and in part um, her work uh, on the FAM care study shined a much brighter light on this issue in 2018 and over um, the last number of years, uh, a number of us in the HIV community have prioritized treatment optimization, particularly among children. In 2019, EGPAF, um, with our partners that are here today and speaking, including PEPFAR, USAID, PACT, CARES Foundation International, and donor partners, DNDI, Unitaid, CHI, collectively began providing targeted support in eight African countries to accelerate access to WHO recommended child-friendly ARVs. Um, this partnership has led to improved national quantification and supply management for pediatric ARVs. It's led to revised national guidelines um, and essential medicines lists. Um, it resulted in training materials, job aids, counseling cards, scores of trained healthcare workers, and better engagement with caregivers and community groups to ensure more effective, palatable, and easily administered treatment regimens are available to children living with HIV. That's the point, obviously. As a result, by early 2021, more than 20,000 children in the collectively supported sites across focus countries were transitioned from suboptimal nivirapine and efavirenz-based regimens to WHO-recommended lopinavir, ritonavir, and dalutegavir-based regimens increasing the proportion of eligible children on optimal ARVs from an average of 40% in 2019 to 90% in 2021. Now, with WHO's latest guidance, another shift is needed. Pediatric DTG to treat children down to four weeks of age and weighing at least three kilograms. So as we move forward, uh, uh, towards ensuring broad access to this breakthrough uh, child-friendly formulation. It's important to draw the lessons uh, that have been learned in this work in moving children to lopinavir, ritonavir, and dalutegavir-based regimens. The, I think uh, fairly obvious questions are, uh, and that will be discussed, are what successes, um, what did we learn, what works as we move more children into new formulations of pediatric DTG? What concerns are caregivers and communities have in rapid change in treatment protocol? And how can we better support these individuals in getting more children on novel treatment formulations? That's what this uh, discussion aims to do. Um, and if we can move to slide, three, Sarah, just to walk through, that's the agenda for today. Um, I won't walk through um, all the details of it. You can see it there. Um, Lynn Moffinson, um, followed by a short video, Dr. Nat, um, George Cybury, Dr. Sherry uh, Florence uh, will speak from GMP 
plus George will moderate um, and be clear about some resources that are available. And uh, Clint Cavanaugh um, should be able to join us during the course of the webinar and provide closing remarks. Sarah, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I think everyone knows this stuff by heart, um, but uh, we're all muted. Um, but please put any questions and so on in the Q&A box. It is recorded. Um, and as others will make clear, and will be in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, the, the presentation slides and so on are going to be um, uh, available. Uh, if you got to have any difficulties, either Sarah or Alex uh, can be contacted there in the last point if you have any questions. So with that, I'd like to turn it over um, to Lynn Moffinson, um, who will provide a much better overview and more detailed overview um, to kick off the webinar. Lynn, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chip, and hello, everybody. Next slide, please, Sarah. Look, back one. Yes, okay. So I want to start by um, giving you an overview of the Odyssey study that was presented at CROI in 2021, um, because this will be the study I'm talking about for the next couple of slides. This was a randomized non-inferiority trial of dolutegravir versus standard of care in children, median age of 12 years, weight of 31 kilos, starting either first line, Odyssey A, or second line treatment, Odyssey B, in eight countries. The primary outcome was viral or clinical failure, and the results showed superior efficacy of dolutegravir, an 8% less failure by 96 weeks than standard of care in these older children. Next, please. So at the pediatric workshop, uh, Odyssey in younger children was presented. So they enrolled children in three weight bands for intensive dolutegravir PK. Uh, and while not specifically powered for efficacy, they did look at it. 85 children were enrolled with the median baseline age of 1.4 years, 85% starting first line, 15% second line, with standard of care treatment being lopinavir, ritonavir, and 74%. Median follow-up was 120 weeks and only five were lost to follow-up. Next. So this looks at viral or clinical failure by 96 weeks. Dolutegravir is in blue, standard of care in red, and you can see the primary endpoint, 26% in dolutegravir versus 49% in standard of care had viral or clinical failure. The primary reason for driving this endpoint was the virologic, which was a viral load greater than 400 in 19% of dolutegravir versus 37% of standard of care. Clinical events were relatively similar. Next, please. And this shows you Kaplan-Meier time to viral or clinical failure. And you can see the differences between the arms only first emerge after one year on treatment. Next, please. And this looks at uh, their primary analysis, a Bayesian analysis, where they pooled the data from the older and younger children. And it looks at the difference in proportion with viral or clinical failure. And you can see that dolutegravir is clearly better with 11% less failure with dolutegravir. Next, please. This looks at viral load less than 50 or less than 400 at week 48 and week 96. And you can see at week 48, there really wasn't much difference between uh, the arms, but by week 96, there were major differences with 76% of those on dolutegravir versus 50% on standard of care less than 50 and 91% uh, on dolutegravir less than 400 compared to 71% standard of care. Next, please. There were no differences in adverse effects, similar rates of adverse effects and serious adverse effects between the arms. Most of the grade three uh, events were infections or hematologic and not related to drug. 
There were only two treatment modifying events and those occurred only in the standard of care arm. And there were six deaths, two in the dietary four in standard of care, not significantly different. Next. And this shows you change in total cholesterol from baseline dietary is in blue, standard of care in red. Most of the standard of care was lopinavir and ritonavir. And you can see no change with dietary but an increase in total cholesterol with lopinavir and ritonavir. Next. So in summary, as in older children, dietary was superior to standard of care in young children less than 14 kilos. At 96 weeks, a higher proportion in dietary were suppressed. Adverse events were similar, few treatment changes, all in the standard of care arm. And all of this provided strong support for WHO guidelines and rollout of dietary for younger children starting first or second line treatment. And certainly uh, points to the need to expedite procurement of dispersible dietary tablets for young children. Next, please. Then there were a number of presentations from the original cohort in Odyssey, the older cohort, and this looks at viral failure and genotypic resistance. Uh, and viral failure is defined, as you see here, for Odyssey A, 7% in dietegravir versus 19% in standard of care had uh, viral failure. For Odyssey B, second line, it was 16% versus 20%. And all patients with viral failure were tested for resistance with the closest sample to their uh, viral load greater than 1,000 after failure. And then earlier baseline samples were sequenced if resistance mutations were identified to determine the incidence of new mutations developing during the study. Next, please. So this looks at uh, genotypic resistance in children randomized to first-line treatment. And if you look at the graph here, you can see there are no blue bars there were no resistance mutations with failure of first-line dolutegravir. Whereas in the standard of care first-line treatment, which was NNRTI-based, for those with viral failure, 93% had NNRTI and 62% had NRTI resistance without PI resistance. Next, please. This now looks at viral failure in children on randomized to second-line treatment. Uh, in the standard of care arm here, most children were on protease inhibitors, 92%. Um, and what you can see if you look on the chart on the left, um, which is overall resistance, is that the blue bars and the brown bars are relatively similar. And so resistance with viral failure on second line was similar with dolutegravir versus standard of care for all classes except integrase inhibitors. I'll talk about that in a sec. But if you turn your attention to the right uh, graph, which looks at the proportion with new resistance post failure. So didn't have resistance at baseline, but developed resistance. You can see that a new resistance to NRTIs, NNRTIs and PIs were only seen in the standard of care arm. Uh, in the dolutegravir arm, uh, four children, 18% had second line integrase inhibitor resistance. Three of these four on AZT3TC as a backbone. Next, please. This just looks at the type of resistance mutations as, as might be expected. M184 was the most common NRTI, K103, the most common NNRTI. There were two PI mutations in one child in the standard of care arm. And then here you see four children on second line dolutegravir developed one or more of the three integrase inhibitor mutations. Next, please. This looks at time to resuppression, which is the solid line, or time to uh, switch in the dotted line post failure in uh, children. So in the brown, you can see if you're looking at the dotted line here, 15% of children in standard of care switched regimens by week 48, 30% by week 96, with no switching in the dietegravir arm. And now if we look at suppression in the solid line, a high proportion of children with viral failure resuppressed after viral rebound, even without switching treatment. And this was marginally better in the dolutegravir arm, 58% resuppressed compared to 42% uh, standard of care by week 72. Next. 
So dolutegravir had a high genetic resistance barrier in children and children failing first line, no resistance seen. And those on second line, there were no new resistance mutations except for four children developing new integrase inhibitor resistance. A high proportion of children resuppress after a rebound without even an antiretroviral switch. But I will note that none of the children, the four children with integrase inhibitor resistance, had resuppressed by the end of the trial. So this supports use of dolutegravir for both first and second line treatment, but certainly ongoing adherence support is needed, especially if the child is on second line dolutegravir. Next. This now looks at weight gain and change in BMI. Um, the, in adults, there are concerning data that dolutegravir is associated with excessive weight gain. So again, this is the original cohort. First line, most were NNRTI based. Second line, most lopinavir based. The NRTI backbones were primarily abacavir 3TC. Next. So at baseline, 11% were thin, 5% were overweight, only 1% were obese. Next. So this looks at change in baseline weight and height in dolutegravir in blue versus standard of care in red. And you can see there were small additional gains from baseline weight and height with dolutegravir. At 96 weeks, the mean added gain in weight was one kilo and in height was 0.8 centimeters. And you can see the difference occurred early and stabilized. Next. This now looks at uh, BMI. And again, you see some small additional gains from baseline BMI and BMI for age in dolutegravir in blue. The mean additional gain was 0.3. And again, the differences occurred early and the gap between arms did not increase with time. Next. Differences were similar, whether you were on first or second line by sex, age, and NRTI backbone. 4% only were newly overweight or obese, uh, and it was similar in both arms, 4% dolutegravir, 3% standard of care. Next. So children grew better after starting dolutegravir compared to standard of care. Differences between the arms were small and stabilized. Very few became newly overweight. And in this study, dolutegravir-based treatment was not associated with excessive weight gain in children. Next. Uh, there were uh, somewhat different data coming from Tanzania, and this was a retro retrospective study of 229 adolescents, 10 to 19 years, on dolutegravir treatment for greater than six months, most of whom switched, and almost all of whom were virally suppressed, and they compared weight before the dolutegravir switch and then six months after the dolutegravir switch. At baseline, 98% were normal BMI and only 1.7% were overweight. Next. After six months, 90% of the youth gained weight, although only 18% uh, gained uh, six or more kilos. And the percent of youth overweight increased from 1.7% before to 8.7% after being on dolutegravir for six months. Next, please. So in contrast to the Odyssey trial, in this study, not a randomized trial, there was an increase in the percent overweight adolescents after six months on dolutegravir. So this care clearly needs further research. Next, please. Uh, so I now want to talk a little bit about other studies. This study looked at the impact of pediatric art optimization in Tanzania. And this was a retrospective cross-sectional review of program data from 325 facilities in five regions in Tanzania to assess optimization either to lopinavir if less than 20 kilos or dolutegravir if over 20 kilos and viral suppression in children. Next, please. So within two years, between June 2018 and June 2020, Children on the optimal regimen, if you're looking at the left, increased from 9% to 86%. And if you look on the right at viral suppression, viral suppression increased over the same period overall from 60% to 83%. Additionally, children on lopinavir, ritonavir as the optimal regimen 
had lower viral suppression, 76%, compared to dolutegravir, 89%. And so we may see added benefit once dolutegravir becomes available for young children instead of lopinavir or Next. Now, this is a study that looks at dolutegravir transition in Mozambique in over 3,100 HIV positive pediatric children over five years at 16 facilities in Mozambique. Um, clinical record extraction was done and the data were collected in rounds. Uh, the first round looked at switching, the second round looked at viral response, and the third round is ongoing. Next, please. So 80% of the children switched, one switch in 62%, but a large number switched multiple times, two switches, 27%, three switches, 8%, four to six switches, and 3%. Next, please. Of those who switched, 81% switched to a dolutegravir-based regimen within six months. And you can see most of these are changing from NNRTI. Next, please. However, 16% of children switched to dolutegravir and then switched back to other regimens within six months. Next, please. So at the last visit, 74% of children were on dolutegravir. Most had switched and a number had been on dolutegravir for the full six month follow-up. Next, please. So why were there so much switching and why did people change from dolutegravir? Well, at least five sites reported stockouts of dolutegravir. Uh, and some of this reflected broader stockouts at the province or national level. Additionally, 15% of children who switched to dolutegravir and then switched back had at least one recorded weight less than 20 kilos, and providers may, of course, correct it because 20, less than 20 kilos wasn't eligible for dolutegravir. Next, please. This now looks at viral load analysis. Uh, over 1,100 children were on continuous dolutegravir for three or more months. Of these, 1,085 had viral load results available, and 998 had both pre and post viral load available. And you can see the results in the table. Undetectable to less than 50 was 41.9% pre dolutegravir, 70% post dolutegravir. And if you look at um, suppressed uh, 50 to 1,000, it was 9 versus 80.6%, so a significant increase. Next, please. So this study is from the CPAC group and looks at the impact and cost effectiveness of viral load testing to inform transition to dolutegravir. So there is a controversy about whether you should switch the NRTI backbone if there is viral failure. So they modeled the cohort of HIV positive children aged eight years on a back of your 3TC in a Favrins with three different strategies. The first strategy is no dolutegravir, the child remains on the back of your 3TC of Fabrins until they fail and then they switch to PI. The second is transitioning all children to dolutegravir without viral load testing with an assumption that 30% of these will be failing on a Fabrins, 70% will be suppressed, everybody gets switched, and then the efficacy will depend on the reason for prior failure. You can see assumptions here. The last is transition to dolutegravir with a viral load-based switch of the NRTI. So here you have kids who are on the drugs, they have a viral load, they wait three months for results, and we have our viral failure group that switched to AZT, 3TC dolutegravir, uh, and then our suppressed group that stay on a back of their 3TC and switch to dolutegravir, and assumptions here for uh, failure rates. Next, please. So this now looks at the clinical outcomes. So both dolutegravir strategies in uh, green and in purple had a better life expectancy than no dolutegravir, 33 versus 38.95 versus 39.43. Dolutegravir with viral load testing had a lower life expectancy than switched to dolutegravir without viral load testing, mostly due to assumed lower efficacy of twice daily AZT associated with the viral load testing strategy. Next, please. 
And in terms of cost, both dolutegravir strategies had cost savings compared to no dolutegravir. Dolutegravir without viral load testing gave you more life years at a slightly higher cost than dolutegravir without, with viral load testing. And it resulted in it being the preferred strategy with a cost effectiveness ratio of 850 per life year saved, well below the threshold of cost effectiveness of 3000 for South Africa. Next, please. So transition to dolutegravir is going to improve outcomes and save money, regardless of the use of viral load testing to select NRTIs. And results of the uh, dolutegravir and viral load testing depended on two things, effectiveness of AZT compared to abacavir for which there are limited data, and the amount of delay in time to return to viral load results. And in sensitivity analysis, if AZT was at least as clinically effective as abacavir, then the dolutegravir with viral load testing strategy was preferred. And if the time to receive viral load result was less than a month, such as if you use point of care testing, then dolutegravir and viral load testing was again preferred. So if viral load testing is used to guide transition, the use of point of care or other strategies to improve viral load return time should be implemented. And clearly we need long-term data on efficacy of dolutegravir in combination with different NRTIs as dolutegravir in children um, occurs. Next, please. And so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Nat from the Karis Foundation in Haiti uh, to discuss pediatric dolutegravir, a Haiti caregiver and patient perspective. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm Nat Segrin. I'm a pediatrician. I've worked in Haiti for 14 years as the country director of Karis Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Karis has, um, so Haiti was actually selected as one of the early introduction countries for the five milligram dolotegravir uh, dispersible tablet uh, for, for, uh, formulation. We've, we've had dolotegravir DTG uh, since March this year of the 50 milligram version, but uh, we received the five milligram uh, version uh, in late May uh, of this year. Um, Karis has two uh, USA uh, supported projects. The first is the OBC program, which began in 2009. It's currently known as Impact Youth, and it supports the National Early Infant Diagnosis of HIV program, the DREAMS portfolio for USAID and provides microfinance, kitchen gardens, malnutrition support, and school support for PLHIV, the caregivers, and, uh, and the pediatric population. We have two um, you know, large psychosocial uh, group activities. The first is the Caris Kids Club, and this is a, a psychosocial activity for uh, young people and children living with HIV from the age of about three until over, over 18, actually. Um, and these... Uh, these young people come together every month at, at the sites and learn about adherence, the importance of uh, viral suppression, their medication. We also discuss disclosure with, uh, with the permission of their uh, caregivers and uh, other health and social um, important subjects. The Caris Mothers Club is uh, exclusively for a women who are HIV positive, who are pregnant, breastfeeding, and have young children under the age of two. Um, and again, we talk about uh, the risk of transmission, ways to uh, minimize PMTCT transmission and um, other health uh, topics, including you know, suppression and ARV drug regimens. Since 2018, Caris has also been a care and treatment partner. We support 18,200 uh, PLHIV um, across 40 sites in all 10 departments of Haiti and geographic departments. And really it's been the close collaboration between these two projects across the OBC platform and the care and treatment platform that has allowed us to rapidly uh, scale up changes in regimens such as the DTG transition for adults and children. We have shared offices and we have shared weekly data-driven planning meetings where we review all children um, across the, the, the two projects. Next slide, please. Um, so we have 2,500 uh, children who are positive between eight, zero to 18 under the OBC program. 
1,100 of these children follow up regularly within the Caris Kids, Kids Clubs. We have 3,100 women in the Caris Mothers Clubs, and um, we have very close, regular contact with the pediatric population. Almost all of the Kids Clubs, the Caris Kids Club children have been transitioned already to DTG. And because we have a large, um, good communication with many of the caregivers in the mothers clubs, this has um, made it you know, much, much faster and much easier to discuss this transition and actually um, conduct this transition. We instituted the direct uh, a DOTS program for um, children who, was, who were not virally suppressed uh, across the country. And this is a daily visit from a health agent uh, to children and their family who accept these visits where we discuss um, and supervise the, the giving of the ARVs for, the, for three months and then a retest of viral load. And then after that, we, we uh, have a reduced level of uh, visitation. Um, and really we built a lot of this pediatric trans transition across uh, from our experience with the adult DTG transition, which has occurred you know, last year and, and successfully in Haiti. Next slide, please. You know, what, what are the strategies we use to, you know, education and sensitization amongst all of our mothers and kids uh, club members. We trained all of the clinical staff at all the sites on transition, including health agents and all, all the clinical staff there. We visit and call uh, using, uh, you know, mobile phones and SMS and WhatsApps to caregivers and discuss their medication. We, because of you know, issues with geography and political instability and, and the violence and issues we've had in Haiti recently over the last two years. We've really had to uh, address and adopt the multi-month strategy for children and community drug distribution. Um, and you know, one of our biggest strategies for DTG transition was to have large sessions at the clinical sites with caregivers and their children to explain the change and to start treatment change, uh, you know, at the site during these sessions. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the issues we've had uh, with the transition, we didn't have enough of the formulation for all children at once. So the, uh, the supply chain uh, caused some kind of slight delays across this. Uh, the confusing advice, the national guidelines required viral load um, checks as part of the, of the transition. And I'm very happy the previous presenter mentioned you know, the minimal, you know, the, you know, basically there's no difference between the VL guide uh, to transition. It was very, very interesting to, to read, but we have had significant delays with viral load um, sampling because of reagent problems and laboratory problems. The, the same lab is running all of the COVID specimens as well for, for the country. So, you know, delays of, you know, three, four, six months are, um, are the norm or have been the norm. Um, and that has caused a severe problem. So you know, there's been some reluctance from clinicians to transition because they were you know, apparently contravening the, the guidelines of the ministry, even though we did not have access to, to viral load testing that was, was rapid. And of course the instability and uh, insecurity we've had has led to decreased visits from patients and the constant interruption of plans for you know, us as a you know, public health system. There have been no issues with patient acceptability. The, the patients have really, really accepted well uh, a change to this medication. And often it's because the caregivers themselves have had a personal experience of DTG um, with the decreased side effects and um, you know, reduced uh, frequency of administration of the medication. And that has facilitated the pediatric DTG transition. Uh, with Ruth Mayal, Dorian's mom. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm George Cyberry. I'm a pediatrician and medical officer at the Office of HIV AIDS at USAID, working on supporting PEPFAR. And I'm just going to give a little scene setting and then introduce our uh, uh, two of our follow-up speakers. So I'd like to, next slide, um, just highlight the important role that our OVC, Orphans and Vulnerable Children, programs and our CSOs, our civil society organizations play in so many things, but in particular when it comes for support for optimization of pediatric HIV treatment and especially uh, the switch over to DTG. 
I think many of you know um, the important role that these organizations play uh, in many ways in supporting caregivers and children um, as they are doing their best to take their HIV medicine every day, helping them understand the importance of it and also learn about new regimens like DTG regimens and the potential advantages and reasons that they would be switching over uh, to that regimen. These programs um, are located in the communities. They are the communities and it makes them especially well positioned um, to understand what the needs are, to understand what the challenges are for children and their families uh, and really support them in a, in a really effective way. In addition, they're an important link back to our clinical providers, the doctors, nurses, and others at the health facility, uh, and can make, again, um, important links, assisting with not just staying in, in, keeping your appointments at the clinic, but helping the clinical providers know how they can better serve uh, children and their families. Next slide. So this, in just a diagrammatic way, shows the different roles, and you can see that there are these roles are complementary and at times synergistic between the OVC programs and the civil society organizations. Um, you can see that community-based service delivery that OVC programs really focus on and really drives at that psychosocial support and case management for children and their families. You can see on the far right, the civil society organizations uh, play a very special role in community-led monitoring that helps make sure that the community perspective uh, and observations are what's driving our understanding of, of how well programs are operating and that they're operating in a client-centered way. And then in the middle are areas of synergistic overlap, demand creation and advocacy, uh, really important aspects um, to build interest awareness and drive um, for important ways to improve outcomes for children and their families. Next slide. So um, it's a real pleasure then to welcome two speakers, one who will speak from the perspective of OVC programs and one from the perspective of a civil society organization. Dr. Asheri Barankena and Ms. Florence Annam uh, will be our speakers today. Next slide. And I'll just introduce first uh, Dr. Asheri Barankena. As a medical doctor with HIV and public health training, Dr. Asheri has over a decade of experience combating the HIV epidemic in Tanzania. She joined PAC in 2016 and is now their deputy chief of party in Tanzania. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Asheri. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you the experience from an OVC program, um, working with caregivers uh, to ensure transition of uh, to the new pediatric uh, uh, regimen. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, the OVC program in Tanzania is funded by uh, PEPFA through USAID Tanzania, a five years program, and we are in our final year, and we are covering um, 85 uh, SNUs, uh, but uh, comprehensive services where uh, services for children living with HIV are, we are uh, implementing that into 81 councils. And um, over 500 facilities uh, that we, we 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 work with is a community program, and we are using um, community case workers, community volunteers through um, Tanzania National Integrated Case Management under the Minister of Health, uh, where we have uh, specific steps into enrolling children living with HIV and their caregivers and the entire family. Uh, that cut across uh, five major steps, um, which are HIV sensitive. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'll also um, uh, share uh, with you uh, the five um, major roles that the OVC program through our civil society organizations and community case workers are doing to support uh, transition uh, to new pediatric ARV. Uh, one item is for us to build a, a capacity for the community case workers who reaches out to caregivers. And in doing so, we um, have worked with EGPAF as a, our consortium partners in the USID Kizazi Kipia project to develop uh, materials for uh, training these volunteers on pediatric HIV. Um, and we 
worked with our national AIDS control program um, to reach out to our volunteers with uh, uh, that particular training. But also our volunteers meet on a monthly basis where we use that opportunity to continue with the in-service training, um, uh, communicating new updates, communicating changes, uh, using our healthcare providers uh, from nearby health facilities. Um, and uh, the second part uh, is uh, working with uh, uh, facilities, health facilities, identifying children who are not on optimal regimen, uh, where our volunteers now, once uh, these children have been identified at the facility where we also have a specific um, kind of staff within our OVC program, uh, visiting health facilities, uh, they usually uh, communicate with uh, volunteers, uh, identifying those children who are to come to the facilities uh, for us to be able to provide uh, a particular a particular service. Uh, and again, at national level, uh, we have been provided with um, access to a national database where we can link um, <coughs> OVC uh, information to the clinical data where children who are yet to be switched to an optimal regimen uh, can be identified and using the same uh, structure of communication, reaching out to the caregivers and their families for a proper referral to a facility for a proper management. Next slide, please. So um, we, we also supporting um, through this program, supporting caregivers of children living with HIV and families. Uh, to try to address some other cross-cutting issues uh, that will either boost adherence uh, or attention to, to clinic to ensure that we don't have interruption to, to, to services. So we, uh, this program offer also uh, support um, uh, to visit these families uh, upon need uh, so that these families are able to attend uh, clinics timely. Uh, and we know some of the um, uh, things that are challenges for them is transport. So this program also offer uh, transport support. Uh, caregivers are also provided uh, with adherence counseling through our, um, our community case workers, uh, but community case workers also uh, take part uh, during uh, some of the important adherence counseling sessions at the health facility so that what is being addressed at the facility can also continue to be addressed at the community. Uh, we also support uh, uh, linking our, uh, the clients to for viral testing and MD as well. Uh, the program also uh, provides support to specific home visits from either a clinician or a nurse or a social welfare officer at the household to address some of the things that might hinder switching uh, to some of the medication. But as well, we are covering a bit around other important cross-cutting issues, uh, economic uh, status of the household, to ensure that they can also access food, they can also um, attend some medical needs uh, upon, uh, upon need. But again, another important piece is uh, our collaboration with the clinical partners, with the care and treatment partners, uh, having regular meeting at the facility to identify these needs, um, being able to share the data among ourselves so that we are able to, uh, to tell if at all things are working or not and then working together to track uh, clients to ensure that we don't have interruption to, to treatment. And that piece of tracking also involves identifying children who uh, they have not yet switched so that we're able to track them at the community and support them to come to the facility. Next slide, please. So upon um, having done uh, all of that, uh, we understand our OVC program aims to reach 90% of children living with uh, HIV in areas where we're implementing the program. Uh, so uh, uh, coverage procs at the moment, we have reached 77% of uh, children uh, living with uh, HIV in areas where uh, OVC program is being, is being implemented. Next slide, please. I would also uh, like to, to highlight how over time uh, uh, using uh, the national uh, database, but also some data that we share amongst ourselves with our clinical partners, we have been fairly increasing uh, uh, the percentage of uh, children who are actually uh, in the right regimen. And uh, this quarter and last quarter, 
we have reached uh, 76% and 72% uh, for, 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 D, for DTG. Next slide, please. Uh, but also, I would like also to uh, point out um, uh, how of those children that uh, we have in, uh, in, in the OVC program, uh, uh, we've been able to look at uh, their viral uh, suppression, and this is uh, Q3 data uh, by end of June. So our viral suppression is uh, at 90% uh, uh, 90, 90%, and uh, we continue now working with uh, our clinical partners, Avaxade uh, earlier, to kind of like identify uh, those who are in the right regimen, those who have interruption of treatment, and to address those uh, bottlenecks. Next slide, please. I also uh, would like to uh, provide a bit of, uh, of a picture how uh, now uh, children who are on ART are faring. Uh, the graph on your, on your left shows uh, viral suppression is at 90, 90%, but uh, we see uh, a bigger viral suppression rate for those who are on DTG-based uh, regimen of 92%. Uh, but again, if you look at, at, at age categories, you find uh, uh, those who are between one to four years, uh, the viral suppression uh, is a little bit uh, a little bit lower. And probably with the availability of pediatric uh, DTG as we are moving forward, uh, could be an area uh, where we'll have a significant improvement. Uh, at same way, if you look at your, the graph on your right, we were trying to look at if you're adjusting other factors, uh, DTG uh, were superior. So I think uh, continue to ensure that uh, children are being switched as an important part of our work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, there are a few things I would also like to point out as part of uh, uh, success into working with uh, children uh, living with HIV at the community. I think it's important to continue ensuring the collaboration with the clinical partner. I think it's vital for us to be able to continue building capacity of community case workers, issues related to data sharing, uh, working with facility at the facility to kind of like identify those who uh, will need a, a support uh, at the community, include uh, uh, ensuring that children optimized uh, regimen. Uh, but again, um, uh, an important piece is access to clinical data where an OVC program uh, can continue to access the, this data, use the data, and make informed uh, informed decision as uh, we are implementing the, the, the program. And we believe OVC program will continue to have an important role in improving uh, viral load monitoring as well as uh, switching to right medication so that we are able to, to attain uh, the best outcome for, for, for children. Next slide, please. So um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to welcome Florence for uh, uh, the next presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherry. And um, uh, just a brief intro, Florence Annam is a program manager at the Global Network of People Living with HIV, GNP+. She's based in Kenya, a seasoned HIV and sexual reproductive and uh, reproductive health and rights advocate, and really pleased that she'll be talking to us today. Florence? Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to start by saying civil society and community have engaged in varied forms of intervention over the years to ensure um, access to HIV prevention, treatment and care for all, and particularly in supporting caregivers and communities to effectively transition children to new pediatric formulations. They've been quite some number of changes in the last few years. The last three years specifically, a group of civil society have collaborated with GNP Plus to call for access to optimize treatment for children born and living with HIV to ensure that early infant diagnosis and timely viral load testing by calling for point of care diagnostic tools happens. So the recent WHO guidelines are very, very welcomed because they provide both the opportunity for children to access this optimized treatment, as well as point of care diagnosis for testing and viral load monitoring. So in my discussion today, and I'm highlighting with those pictures, what, what a civil society we've been able to do so far, I will highlight some of these things in my discussions, 
that we are doing and will continue to do to support care, caregivers and children, and also discuss how they are going to be very important and much needed now as we transition our children to pediatric DTG. Next slide. So one of the most um, critical role for the community is, is demand creation, as you may know. And, and my Dr. Shari also sort of spoke to this uh, practically from what they are doing in their program, breaking down the science of the disease and then informing communities of what the treatment is, how it works, why it is important for people to use it, but also you know, using that opportunity of creating awareness to promote testing. And this testing is not necessarily just for children, but also starting it from the point of if adult are, adults are tested and they know their HIV status, we are able to effectively contribute to preventing vertical transmission. So, but because the, in this case, we are talking about children already living with HIV, promoting testing for early infant diagnostics, making mothers understand why it is important to know um, the HIV status of a child early enough so that they start treatment early. We, communities or, um, and civil society also work to, to, towards supporting ART uptake and retention. So reinforcing treatment literacy um, for guardians and the community, why people have to take treatment at a particular time and keep to time, why adherence is important. And doing this using also social mechanisms, just understanding each other how how we relate context-wise, the problems that we sometimes face context specifically that are very much removed from some of the biomedical requirements that happen in our treatment journey. So these can be done through platforms like one-on-one -on -one sessions by facilitators or mentor mothers or home visits or support groups that are, are, are useful for identifying children that need to be initiated to treatment or to be transitioned to you know, optimized treatment. It's also a platform to identify those challenges that mothers and caregivers face, answer questions, particularly about adverse effect, you know, effects of the treatment. Why am I feeling like this? Why did I start this treatment? And all of a sudden, my child, you know, is the rearing. What, what do I do? I mean, we have had experiences where, you know, like from the previous lopinavir treatment where mothers were having difficulty with storage. How do I store my treatment, particularly for mothers who are trying to hide the status of their children and therefore cannot be able to keep their treatment somewhere where people would see it. So having to, you know, troubleshoot and figure out what would work for different people. So this, this is some of those support mechanisms that civil society and communities are able to do. But of course, as well, link to social protection programs for those who who really, really required, particularly for orphans and vulnerable children. Then the stigma, and, and, and we cannot be able to move if, if people do not have you know, an enabling environment to come forward for, for testing, for treatment uptake, and to be able to use the treatment once they get it. And so addressing stigma is also a very critical role. And this can be about you know, educating people on their rights, monitoring and documenting cases and trying to change either systemic or, or structural barriers that exist, empowering the community so that they're able to understand that, you know, this is right, this is wrong. And if you're treated like this, it's in contravention of your rights and being able to stand up and speak for themselves. And also building them, you know, resource-wise to, to, to mobilize around these issues and around the, the changes that are needed you know, to deal with the social power norms and other things that, you know, ultimately promote stigma and discrimination, discrimination in the community, like gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we will continue doing, um, already doing, is advocacy. I think we've we've really moved in the last three years a section not not many I uh, we've always asked that we talk about children because they continue to be left behind no one speaks for them obviously but continuing this advocacy particularly at country level is critical now we have the guidelines they need to be translated at country level and adopted we need people to be able to to participate in those processes and community representatives will definitely do that and give practical you know, implementation um, experiences that can be used for planning at country level. 
I think also important for advocacy is participating in the country planning and implementation processes like PEPFA, um, country operational planning and global fund you know, planning up to and including you know, discussions around quantification and, and addressing stock so that there's enough of that for children because I think where there's lack of community participation in these processes, you tend to experience a lot of issues like stockouts or implementation in ways in which it's not responsive to community. And we have now opportunities within the just adopted political declaration on HIV, which is aligned to the global aid strategy that calls for, you know, 30% of testing, 80% of HIV prevention services and 60% of programs supporting achievement of social enablers be done by communities. And there's opportunity to leverage on these commitments to do that. Research, also very important. Data informs policy. If it's not documented, nobody can be able to plan around it. So community have been doing and will need to be supported to do more of quality values and preferences across treatment, quality of service delivery, how, how are services being delivered, what, what works, what kind of differentiated service delivery models would work for different, you know, um, diverse groups of, of caregivers and mothers and children across, across the world. And of course, using our lived experience primarily to do this. Monitoring and accountability, also a very important aspect. We are making commitments, we are making plans within those commitments. Communities need to be empowered and will continue to do the monitoring that is required to identify where stockouts exist, where you know, treatment disruptions exist, um, highlighting challenges that people are facing as they are using various treatment. Um, and of course, as we initiate and transition people to DTG, what kind of challenges are happening within those within that transition, the confusion, they're not understanding what's going on. Why, why is it now one tablet? Why all of a sudden I have to change my time? So all these questions, sometimes we, we get to answer that probably people are shy from asking at, at, at the health facility, but also where there are gaps in explaining these, um, civil society can be able to package those experiences and inform you know, implementers and planners so that, that better, better implementation strategies are, are developed. So in closing, I would like to underscore that for all civil society and community work to be consistent and effective, funding and other resource capacities must be made available. And I, I'm calling on all partners, donors and program implementers on this call to do their bit towards ensuring that we meet all the targets on community leadership in HIV programming for our children. Thank you very much. Lawrence, that was terrific. Thank you so much. So uh, we will move now into the discussion section and I've already um, been looking at lots of great questions coming through in the Q&A. Um, we will answer questions that come in digitally first. So use that Q&A box at, on your screen. Um, it's at the bottom of your screen, type in your question and hit send and um, the host will be notified and respond to your question. Uh, if you can't do it that way or, or want to ask your question out loud verbally, then click raise hand in your toolbar, or if you're on the phone, click star nine to raise your hand, and then the host will unmute you when it's time to take your question. Uh, when you are unmuted, if you're speaking your question, please start with your name and affiliation and then get right to your question, keeping it as brief as possible. Uh, we might not get to all the questions here in the, the live Q&A session, uh, but any questions we don't answer um, right now, we will uh, uh, please welcome um, an email with your question and we will respond to all questions by the end of the day. So um, next slide, please. So as we get ready for the discussion, I also just wanna display here some really helpful resources with links um, to where you can access the full documents. Uh, you know, there's a lot of steps and important aspects in what it takes uh, for the, the launch and scale up and uptake uh, effective use of DTG and kids. And these resources really kind of cover all of um, the different aspects of that. So we'll leave that up here. Um, it, will be, it can be shared after the, the webinar as well. And I encourage you all to, to make good use of, of these resources that people have put a lot of time into. So um, Lynn, get ready because I, there were a lot of questions which you kindly answered in the Q&A. So people uh, may have seen some of those already. 
But I think that one of the things that got a lot of attention, caught the attention of a lot of people was those DTG resistance emergence in the second line um, regimen DTG failures. And I, I think you've alluded to the fact that perhaps, you know, this remains a, a concern about adherence for people who are needing to go on second line. But have you heard also that if a, an enzyme inducing drug like a Favarin's is the regimen that you were on before you switch, that that might be causing a temporary lower level of dilutegravir when you start as a potential reason um, that that resistance could come up more easily? Yeah, uh, George, I, I've heard that hypothetical, but I have not seen that published or presented as an abstract that I can uh, uh, remember. Uh, you know, dietary rear has a really high barrier to resistance, higher than um, the first generation integrase inhibitors like raltegravir. And also cross resistance with the integrase inhibitors depends on what mutation is selected. And the mutation that has the highest level of cross resistance is really associated with carbotegravir and not raltegravir. People had asked about that. Um, people had also asked whether, if there was resistance, whether double dose uh, dalutegravir would be warranted, and there's just no data to to uh, to say that at this point. But uh, I'm not sure that if you have a resistance mutation, that giving a higher dose of dalutegravir is going to um, really help. Um, so I, I think the main message I had from that study was that as we begin to roll out dalutegravir in children, we need to make sure that we're monitoring the rates of viral failure and that we are monitoring development of resistance. Um, and that we shouldn't just assume that when we're switching kids that um, they're on a regimen that doesn't need to have support and adherence support. Great, Lynn, thank you. And I may come back with some other questions. I have some, um, we're gonna go just a few minutes over, uh, but we have um, Dr. Kavanaugh, my boss, the director of the Office of HIV AIDS at USAID. I'd like to give him a chance to give um, some remarks for a couple minutes, and then we will finish up with a couple more questions. Clint? Thanks, George. Uh, it says my video needs to be, but, um... And I will not say that uh, I am George's boss. He really is my boss. Uh, this has been such a timely discussion. I really want to thank all of you. Uh, we are uh, in the Office of HIV AIDS so proud of our, our partners, our global uh, and local stakeholders, including AIDPATH, Karis, Nat, it was wonderful to hear your voice, uh, PACT, and CSOs to really ensure that every child living with HIV in a PEPFAR USAID program has access to optimal art. And as we've heard today, for nearly every child, this will be a DTG-based regimen. Uh, you know, with the approval last year of dispersible DTG tablets for children, we can now offer that to children living with HIV and the families who care for them. Um, a regimen that is easier to take, better tolerated, and more effective than other pediatric art op options. The, uh, the discussion today has really highlighted the important role in, uh, in supporting other caregivers as they transition their children to pediatric DTG. Uh, in, in addition, we've, we were reminded today of the invaluable role uh, our OVC partners, our, uh, our civil society organizations have had in supporting uh, children and families uh, during this uh, crucial time of childhood development. And we've seen through case management, um, OBC partners ensure continuity of care from clinic to home and enabled uh, children and families to access critical psychosocial support and economic support services, while civil society organizations are vital uh, to reducing stigma and uh, advocating for equ equitable care and treatment for children. Together, these organizations offer uh, support beyond the health facility that directly contribute to achieving and maintaining pediatric HIV control. And really just you know, want to highlight again how timely uh, this is. We, within our office, uh, just completed our uh, global Q2 review of data and are continuing to see that viral suppression of children sorely lags uh, viral suppression achievements uh, among ad adults, as you all well know. So we're optimistic that a comprehensive approach to rolling out pediatric DTG 
uh, with the intentional inclusion of caregivers, clinicians, OBC programs, and CSOs uh, throughout the process will help us turn the tide to improve outcomes for children living with HIV. So just want to reiterate how much we value the work that you are doing in this space, how timely it is given that the data, and how much of a priority we are placing on it as an agency and as an office. And so as you continue to identify innovations, solutions, uh, it, it's so important that we continue to translate those across uh, the, the missions and uh, countries that we support. So just want to, thanks. Thanks all, and George, appreciate the uh, the shift in the agenda to allow me just to provide some some final remarks. That was terrific, Clint. Thank you very much for um, joining and, and making those great remarks. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, we will just use another couple of minutes. Um, uh, so many questions, we won't be able to get to them all, but I saw several questions that were asking, what can we do to make sure that there's timely transition uh, over to DTG, especially for those children who are still on Lopinavir, Ritonavir. And I wonder, Dr. Asherian and Florence, from the perspective of OVC and CSO organizations, um, if you could talk a little bit about what you see as most important in getting that transition to happen. Can I go? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, communities need to understand that, that the, the importance of the transition and also to understand that there is security in the fact that once you transition your child there will be better benefits so lesser side effects um, people will I mean your child will get to viral suppression quickly and what that means generally for the health of the child so just communicating that in terms of what the benefit is I mean, like I said earlier, there's been like transitions, a number of them, and, and women are confused. Um, if, if you've had a child probably for the last five years, you're, you're, what you did for your child one is different from what you're going to be doing this year, for example. And so having um, a platform or a program that is community-based, that is able to break this down in a way that community understand is very, very important. But also, um, what mechanisms work for, for, for different people. So embracing differentiated service delivery models would really, really be practical so that the, the, the caregivers and the mothers are supported to ensure that the child accesses their treatment, but also remains adherent to it and are not you know, um, facing barriers. Um, some are transport, some is, is, is the fact that you know, we, we are existing in, in COVID times with restrictions of movement in different places. So trying to, to package our programs in a way that respond to some of these, you know, emerging issues will, will really be critical, but really addressing demand creation in terms of awareness and making the environment favorable for, for, for people to access treatment is, is practically key at this, po at this point. Excellent. Thank you, Florence. Dr. Yeah. Sherry, are you still on there? Yes, I'm still here. Allow me to add uh, one Please. or two points. Yes, so um, addition from what Florence said, uh, I think it's important to look at the community structures and how much uh, they're also being involved in terms of the changes. I've seen most of the communication of the changes going through health facilities, healthcare providers. So that message uh, trickled down very late to the community. So the clients will go to the facility, get the message, and when they come back to the community, have conversation with uh, some community structures which are there, um, all their colleagues, uh, they might tend to get a uh, different opinion and uh, people have different assumptions of things. So I think uh, trying to ensure that knowledge goes through the civil society organization, go through uh, the community volunteers, uh, go through all the structure, the community will be helpful in a very simple language, a very simplified language. I understand the language at the facility might be a bit complicated, but trying to digest that language so that they can grasp the importance and, and see uh, the science behind that and see the changes that are brought with these changes of medication. So involving the community such, I think it's, it's key and that uh, information to trickle down to the community. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, we um, will we 
ran short on time, but I hope people did take a look at the answer Q and A's to see the other answers to questions that were asked. Uh, I personally want to thank um, everybody who was on the panel and all of the participants who really uh, just added so much with their questions and participation, uh, and especially EGPAF um, for really uh, helping organize such a such a terrific webinar. Chip, maybe I'll just turn it over to you um, for the, the final remarks or farewell. Uh, George, thanks. I think just the farewell, you um, said thanks. I would, would want to underscore that. Excellent presentations and discussions. Quite, I agree with you on the, the video. Uh, just incredibly moving when we focus in on indi individual lives and how people are managing and the improvements that can be made uh, for them. So um, thank you uh, to everyone and for committing this uh, amount of time uh, to such an important issue. So uh, with that, George uh, and other panelists, uh, very much appreciate everything that you've done and said um, before this and on the webinar. So we'll end now. Thank you very much.